Is your past a memory that binds you? Is there some pain that you carry for too long? Then strengthen your heart with healing. Greetings and welcome, beloved, to You Have Your Bibles broadcast. This is our once a month offering, and we have labeled it the Pastor's Cove to be a blessing uh, not only to pastors, uh, but teachers and leaders, and church members in general. So we are delighted to be before you and we count it a privilege uh, to be able to come before you at this hour. Well, beloved, you have your Bibles. Would you join me in 1 Peter chapter 5? And we're going to read three verses. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partake of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in sample. To the flock. Our Father and strong God, we thank you for another month that has come and gone. We thank you for this privilege to stand here in your presence and in the sight of not only you, but our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in thy spirit. And these who will be watching tonight and those who will 
tune in later. Ask Holy Father that you fill me with your spirit, with wisdom and knowledge, strength and courage to speak the truth in love. Be thou glorified and exalted, is my prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight's subject is it is impossible to feed the flock of God if they aren't among us. And our focus will be the church, and this is something that I, I hear, generally speaking, cannot be finished with the local New Testament assembly and still be in the church. Since COVID, I've met a lot of people up on this platform by way of this medium. And family and friends that they are, some of them have come out and said, we're done with the church. And I listen to the reasons that they give. And many of them, they are issues that have occurred, I, I'm sure. But tonight, this ministry here, once a month, is to come up and, and be a blessing. I'm not going to take up anyone's time to set out to hurt anyone. We want to help. When I was saved and Lord brought me into the church. I just, I was in love with uh, the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he placed that love for his people, his elect in the Old Testament. Something that I realized, the Jews, and for all Gentiles, and certainly a love that he put in my heart for him. So I come across being very biased to the assembly known as the church, the flock of God. I will listen to grievances. I will pray with those who have been injured, those who have been misled along the way. But if you give this session tonight a prayerful consideration. And Lord willing, come next month as we dive deeper into this subject. If you're one of those that prior to the pandemic you had just made up your mind because of the things that had occurred at the assembly in which you were going to and you were reading your Bible, you were studying, you had a group that you would fellowship with or what have you. I want to encourage you to prayerfully find your place in the assembly. So I want to start off by just giving a definition for the, the word flock. It's a group of believers with the assembly in mind. So it's not just believers spread out. The idea is that eventually they will come together. Our biblical definition is found in, in other places, but in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is writing to this young pastor and it really doesn't matter if he shows up soon or later the instructions that he's going to give him are jewels for the pastor but also for the church in verse 14 these things write I unto thee hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, 
that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. The Apostle Paul is writing to this pastor and this word is to to all pastors as to our business He's covered from chapters 1 up until chapter 3 as to the business of the pastor. And it has everything to do with his behavior. His behavior, he should be a good minister, a servant. A servant of Christ. One who has been observed in his own family and household, within the church and without, as being a servant of Christ. And since we're talking primarily about the church, but we're not limiting his family life and his life amongst those who are not in Christ. But he's to be observed as being about the business of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He can never be observed trying to make inroads into his own agenda, his own interests. What he does ought to reflect the fact that he's a servant. That he's not wearing a title to receive unnecessary honor that's undue to him. Realizing that the greatest honor in the church is to be able to serve and to be the servant of Jesus Christ is that those within the church know that what he does to be observed, what he says that will be heard, that it's in keeping with sound doctrine, that it's in keeping with the will of God. He's a businessman. And there is no question about it when it comes to the business of the church. He's serious, but yet when he's speaking with an elderly sister in the church, mother in the church, I should say, that she feels welcomed into his space. He knows how to communicate. He knows how to get his point across and preach with passion, teach to build up the church, but when he's talking with the believers, everyone is on the same part. Why? Because he's a servant of Christ. And you know my custom, I tend to like to look in scripture and see at least three individuals to not to bring this young pastor up on par with, but to consider Two other men along with Timothy. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he's the servant. In Matthew 20 and 28, he said, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. In Isaiah 42 and verse 1, that there Christ is God's elect. He's the one in whom he has bestowed his spirit upon him without measure. He's the servant of Jehovah. He's the one in whom the Father said, I am well pleased. Then you have Moses. As it is written concerning Moses, that he would 
be of good courage and very courageous as he was speaking to Joshua. That Joshua was to observe and to do according to all that was in the law that Moses and the Lord said, My servant had commanded thee. Moses was a faithful servant of the Lord. And then finally we see the Apostle Paul as servant. And he went on record saying this in Galatians chapter 1. And the other reference was Joshua chapter 1 verse 7. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10 and 11. The Apostle Paul. For I, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be, get this, the servant of Christ. Galatians 1 and verse 10. So Timothy's behavior would have to be in keeping with that of the Christ. Israel's Messiah and the Savior of the world, the Lord of glory, the King eternal, would have to be in keeping with that of Moses, who was faithful in all of his house. And finally, the Apostle Paul, who ran his race with dignity and finished his course as it was set before him with great honor. Timothy's conduct as he is the example in the fellowship. The pastor is the one who sets the tone. If he's serious about Christ, the things of God, the Holy Scriptures, taking care of the church, by feeding the lambs and the sheep and tending to the flock. That's a good minister. If he warns the flock of what he sees over the wall, so to speak, as a watchman. Or from the scriptures as we see the day approaching. And his evil continues to wax worse to prepare the church for difficult times. But rejoicing, but preparing nevertheless. As we consider Christ and Moses, and Paul, each of them had disciples and a nation and people to leave them. In the Gospel of John, John chapter 6, I had thought maybe to come in and do a lot of talking about this subject. But this is sensitive to some folk who have been injured and damaged. But I cannot allow them to remain where they are because of the divine implications. So I want to make sure that we have a, a doctrinal foundation That we have the underpinnings to support one that is impossible for a pastor to take care of those who consider themselves to be in the flock, but yet they're not among the flock. 
And then for a segment of the church to say that they've done with the local New Testament church is where all of the business is happening in the church. I want to be a blessing. I want to help those who know the voice of the Spirit of God. And it's not mine. But it's that still small voice that comes alongside the Holy Scripture. And he gives peace, but also an urgency to remove those who are truly Christ out of their complacency and to get into the house because we need all hands on deck. In John chapter 6 and verse 60, Christ began by letting them know what was required to receive eternal life. You have to believe in him. And then he brought into this teaching that except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, that you don't have eternal life. Well, he told them. He was telling them truth. Now it gets deeper. And notice what happens. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? Well, I admit it's a hard saying. But notice what occurs. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, they murmured at his words, but yet they had been following him. And he was giving them truth, eternal truth. And they had been listening to him. But yet, within themselves, they, they murmured. And he said unto them, Doeth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? If you think I said something back there, listen to this. It is the Spirit that quickeneth the flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He wasn't just talking. This is God draped in human flesh speaking. And he's revealing the, the heart of God as he reveals his own heart and his mission. And what they heard initially about eternal life in him. And then this additional teaching. But there are some of you that believe not. But yet they were following Christ. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given him, or given unto him of my father. Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And you know what Peter's response was. So Christ had disciples who were following him. They were students. He was the master, teacher. 
You know why they stopped following him? It was because of hard truth. What was perceived as a difficult saying. If you think what I said earlier was something, Son of Man will ascend back to where he came from. So Christ had disciples who just went away. Moses had an entire nation saved too. If they could have went back to Egypt, they would have. But they couldn't. And therefore, the Lord allowed their caucuses to fall in the wilderness. Numbers. Chapter 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I've heard the murmuring of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which you said shall be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness and your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness after the number of the days in which ye search the land even 40 days each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquity even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation. Now, who's in view? You have a congregation in view. It just happens to be a nation. Christ had a little flock that is referenced to in the gospel, but these were those who were following him as the little flock was following him. This evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness, they shall be consumed and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land, you remember them? One of their leaders from every tribe who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him. They came back with an evil report. And pastor or pastors, some of the issues that you are having, you have it with those who are in leadership who had poisoned members along the way. God wants to do a great work in one great work after another. 
But you need people to be a part of what it is that God does. And you don't need that infection to work through those who would be willing. And you have someone to come back with an evil report. This happens a great deal in the church. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur, notice this, against him by bringing up a slander upon the land. Even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. So why did those disciples leave Christ? They left over truth. And beloved, if you are out there and you left the congregation that you were in, and perhaps at some point in time, you even had to banner up concerning sound doctrine. But sound doctrine is going to oppose error. It's going to always oppose lies and falsehoods. Sound doctrine is not going to make any allowances for evil and wickedness to be in the church. It will not allow one sin in which God has said, thou shall not. If you left the church over truth, well, then you've left Christ. If it's from the word of God and it's given to us rightly divided, meaning cut straight to the church. That's what happened with those disciples who went away. Those who fell in the wilderness and you got to get this. Christ is the master. He's God. He had disciples to turn away from him. But then he had a man who was cut from a, if I may just use this analogy, the right piece of cloth to lead his people out of bondage where they had adopted some religion in their slavery. And falsehoods and lies. And to bring them before the Lord. Why did they want to go back? Is because they did not want to go forward in what? The truth. They didn't want to see the truth. That whole mission of going over into the promised land was strictly to see the word of God. Not hear it. But see it with your eyes. It was a good land. It was a large land. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. But they found a reason. They found a lot what it was. As to why they shouldn't go up. And they went back and poisoned. Every tribe was poisoned. Except, and I would, would say this, they weren't poisoned by Joshua or Caleb. I know Joshua went up. The truth. The truth caused an entire nation to fall in the wilderness. And then finally the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 He says, once again in verse 9, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me. We know why. Having loved this present world. 
So he forsook the apostle Paul for the world. So he forsook Paul. Well, he has forsaken the church. If he's forsaken the church, he's forsaken Christ. It's as simple as that. If you move away from the one that God is using to impart revelation to, put it in a place where he can get it, and he has the wherewithal to yield to the spirit to teach it, Rather than, rather than say, I'm going to keep it for myself. No, I'm going to give it the way that I received it. You stop following a man like that because of the world. You believe in a lie. So truth separated Demas away from the Apostle Paul. Because we're told not to love the world. Neither the things that are in the world. Verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Apostle Paul mentions him. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom, and he's telling the church, be thou where also. For he hath greatly withstood our word. He's an enemy of truth. He's against the gospel and the holy scriptures. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 again, verse 15 but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Where will Timothy be doing his business in the house of God? It'll be Ephesus. That's not the entire church, but the entire church is in view. When the Apostle Paul persecuted disciples and Christ met him on the road to Damascus and said Saul Saul why persecuted thou me he didn't persecute all disciples he didn't persecute the entire church but he did because that's how Christ took it and since he persecuted some disciples he was responsible and this is something that the apostle Paul never recovered from is that he persecuted the church and he saw it in its entirety or in her entirety. And by doing so, he was persecuting Jesus Christ. You have to see that, beloved. That Timothy would know how to conduct his business how he would live his life away from the church and outside in the world and before the congregation, that those who study him would know that this man is serious when it comes to the things of God and the person of Christ, that this man would run through a wall as though there was an open door, thinking that by the time he gets to the wall, there'd be a door there for him. And every congregation ought to sense that in their pastor. That he's not there on his own behalf. Most of us, especially me, the Lord straight the bottom of the barrel in salvation to save me. And then to bring me into his enterprise. The family business. God's church. The house of God. In which he's purchased. By the blood of his son Jesus Christ. And give me responsibility. I almost don't know what to do with myself. And that's why I teach the way that I do. And I pray.
preach the way that I do. And I've lost folk along the way, came up on this platform and family and friends logging in and views everywhere until that word started to come down where they lived. When they found out that abortion is a problem, homosexuality is an issue with God. Sin is always a problem for the sovereign. What many of them wanted was to be tickled and entertained because we know him and he's on a platform. But many of them, they went away. But when I consider that Christ had disciples to leave over the truth, Moses had an entire nation to bite the dust in the wilderness. And the apostle Paul had not only those two, but others who left him and forsook him. I considered myself to be honored. Even in their departure. Not that I want them to go. I want them to come and hear the word of God. I want them to see God move and work in the lives of those who avail themselves to want to hear the truth of God's word. Brother, it's impossible to shepherd a flock. They say that they're in the flock. It's a lot of people. It's impossible to shepherd those who are not amongst us. And finishing this verse, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. It's the assembly of the living God. The pillar, that's the support and ground of the truth. You have the foundation and that's Christ. You have the apostles who are responsible for laying the foundation of truth. And as the superstructure goes up, it has support columns and a foundation that is sure. This is a truth enterprise, beloved. And those who have left because of pastors. That's why in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, it's good to see the pastor and then the, the company in which he'll be pastoring. A lot of folk have left the church because of who the pastors were or the leadership, what they taught or what they failed to teach, what they did or they did not do. But that's a great problem with this. And I'm almost about ready to bust because this, but I'm going to hold it until... It's time to go because this is going to be your homework. You have a whole month to work on it. There are those who have left the assembly and they left because they were not being fed the word of God. They were not being properly led or shepherded. They didn't sense the divine oversight over their life and over that of their family. There were issues with how much money the pastor or pastors received. That he had a, a very heavy hand. But what I want to get at right now, because what I hear out in social media and the people that I run across, as I go, folk left because of the wolves and they left because of the ambitious men that rose up exactly like the apostle Paul said they, they would. You know, I, I apologize a few times for those who mistreated the saints. I'm not doing that no more. Because if you're a saint, 
You need to thank God for the wolves. You need to give him glory for the ambitious men who rose up in the ranks and started teaching perverse things. And like Lucifer, when he fell, he drew a third of a host with him. Because if these things hadn't happened, but then the apostle Paul would be a liar. And the spirit that spoke that was not the Holy Spirit. It was his own spirit. So you should thank God that if you encountered a wolf, it was because you've been warned. See, here's the problem. It's just like my, my pastor years ago, he said, he said, he said, Dennis, he said, man, I meet members. He said, I'm their pastor. He said, I don't know them. I, I never see them here at the church. He said, I see them in the grocery store. They walk up to me and say, hey, Pastor Swan. He said, I'm one of your members. He said, you one of my members? But here's the problem. When you are not in the assembly the pastors are not responsible unless you are unable, you're sick or you're shut in or your situations where you can't get here. But if you're able to go everywhere else you want to go, we don't have the authority to have the oversight over your life when you are not in the flock. Pastoring, superintending, the appointment side of the office, office is not in the original, but it's an appointment. Christ gives pastors, so it is ordained. It's the gifted men that he put in place to feed the lambs and the sheep. Well, that's an element of that, of giving the oversight, and the Spirit of God is the one who made the overseers to look over the wall like a watchman. Now, Pastors don't have to go anywhere looking for anything. Just like the watchman on the wall didn't have to go looking for trouble, their responsibility was one, stay woke. Two, report what you see. If it's the enemy or if there's somebody riding hard and you don't know who it is, you got to make a report. Because you have everybody behind you to protect. We can't protect you. In prayer, if you're not under the word of God, and the reason why you're not under the word of God, wherever you were, it's a reason. And here's the issue. Many have gone away because it was something that wasn't taught or something that wasn't done. And then found others to community with. So they have a group. Now, I thank the Lord for a group that helps. And I've seen that we've got some hurting people within the church. And I don't want to go into those things, but, but, but that's not the church. That's not the church. The church is not a group where you call or you text or you, you, know, you write in, you know, in, in cyberspace. No, it, it has to be where you come together under the oversight. And see, this is what, this is what troubles me. And I want to say it with all the love I can master is when I hear those who say that they Christ, Jesus, talk about the assembly the same way that the world talks about, I got a problem with that. Because you want to know where the business is happening in the, the church? It's in the neighborhoods where you have a few believers who come together and they are being shepherded and they're being guided in the scriptures. Some little meeting where, you know, everyone contributes to it. That's not church. That's not the church. Someone has to be there to give the oversight. He said, well, oh, but they had the churches and the houses. Yeah, they did. But there was someone who had oversight. Because this is the problem. Turn, if you would, 
and we, we're almost done, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Peter has preached his inaugural message. In verse 40, and with many other words did Peter testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. You're going to have obedience all the way through here. And the same day there were added unto the 120 about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly. They remained in. This was an effort that they applied to continue in the apostles' teaching. Now, if you want to understand the apostles' teaching, go back to the Old Testament. Because the same Lord who was in the Gospels is the same Lord who gave Moses the commandments. He gave those laws and the statutes and the judgments and the precepts and the ordinances and all of those, he gave them to Moses and for the people to gather around Moses to receive it from Moses and to be taught the word of God. Who's doing the teaching? Well, you know who's doing the teaching. It is the Lord doing the teaching by the written word that Moses had that he had received. And he was just a vessel to convey the teaching. See, the Lord is the one who does the teaching. He did it in the Old Testament. He's doing it in the church. How? By his Holy Spirit. So, when you had the whole nation to gather around Moses, every seven years, they would come together and the law would be read to the entire congregation. That's everyone. Listen. So then you had the apostles that what they received as the people came around Moses, well, then the church came around the apostles and it was the same as coming around the person of Christ because Christ had taught them for three and a half years and now what Christ taught them, these men are teaching the church. This is a beautiful setup. Beautiful. But this is what you have to keep in mind. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Could not deviate. Then they didn't deviate. Those who were true. Now, this led to fellowship. And see, what has happened to group and some folk who left the church, now they're in fellowship with others, but they're not in the apostles' doctrine. No, they're not. And see, if you're not in all of it, you're not in any of it. If you're picking and choosing, like I said the other night, like you had Piccadilly's or Morrison's or you were at the Golden Corral, give me some of what Paul said, but you know, I don't want everything Paul said, because y'all know Paul. You, you know. Well, then you can't be in fellowship. You're not in fellowship because... Fellowship came forth out of being and remaining steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in what Christ taught his holy apostles. They remained in fellowship, even Judas, as long as he could, until Satan entered into him and he went out and did what he did. So you may think that you're having Jesus all to yourself on a little island. You can't do that, beloved. And I can hardly wait to tell you what I'm getting need to tell you, but, I, but I'm going to have to wait because that's, that's going to settle this whole issue. I hope you, you settle this thing in your heart when I let you know that. So in other words, if you're going to be in the Apostles' Doctrine, it leads into fellowship. And then from fellowship, look back at verse uh, 42, it leads into the breaking of bread. If you left the Apostles' Doctrine, 
and only do what it is that you do because now you feel like they, they didn't teach this where I was at. You know, they didn't do this where I had been. And now I know what should have been done and I know what should have been taught. And now I'm going to just put that in. I'm just going to teach. I'm going to be responsible for teaching myself. You can't do that, beloved. You can't. God shepherds his people. That's been his method. I'm almost getting ready to let the cat out of the bag. But let's press this a little bit further. In the breaking of bread and in prayers. Prayers that come out of being in the apostles' doctrine. Which leads to fellowship. Which leads to the breaking of bread and in prayers. So I'm not going to come back. Many reasons. Maybe, maybe not that many. But there are several reasons why some folk are not going to come back. And this is going to reveal something. They're not going to come back because along the way they've developed their own doctrine. And wherever they go, if you don't subscribe to everything that I believe, then I can't find a church. There is no church. The other reason, don't want to be under authority. I don't want no one telling me or correcting me when I'm wrong. Here's another reason. I don't want to give no money to an assembly because of the way the pastor lived. Wait a minute. Didn't Paul say beware of the wolves? Didn't he tell you and me that we'll know them by their fruit? The wolves... They are wolves in sheep's clothing. So they're going to be sheepish. You see them? Coy. But it's what they say. It's what their agenda is. It's what's really important to them. And the words, they're going to make allowance for you to sin. They are. Because that's what, the wolf doesn't care about any of that. The only thing the wolf cares about because of his satanic nature is to devour the congregation. To eat them alive. They see a, a tithe, which there's no such thing in the church. But they see an offering. But here's the issue. You mean to tell me you haven't had bad servants somewhere? You've been in the world? When it comes to food, when it comes to you got some bad gas in your car where there was water in it, did you stop using gas? Did you stop going to a supermarket? The Apostle Paul never told us that when the wolves come and the ambitious men arise that we are to quit the local New Testament church. And whatever spirit told you that, that spirit is not of God. And beloved, I want to help you. I'm not trying to hurt you. Suppose you had been in the church where Christ said, I'm going to come and fight with you. Was it not a church? Didn't he write seven letters to seven churches? Did he tell the folk that were there, y'all need to leave the church? Now, there's a time to leave. There's a time when you need to pack everything you got, grab your spouse, and get out of there. But you shouldn't leave over the truth. And it shouldn't bother you. It shouldn't. Really, see, this is the thing. There are those that when they hear a pastor is receiving any kind of an honorarium, any kind of a salary, and we're going to deal with that because it's in the scriptures. Not tonight. We're going to deal with it. See, the same way that you believe the scriptures that aren't being taught where you've been, the same things that you despise are in the word of God. But I mean, you, you got to see this thing for what it is. Who has bewitched you? It was not Christ. Now, there's more I can say about this, but I see my time is, is almost up. You have to understand something here. Is that the church 
is not a Gentile organization from the world. The church made up of unbelieving pagans and Gentiles were grafted into Israel. Israel is the root, so to speak. Christ is in view, so you have branches. And because of unbelief, and we're going to read through that, Romans chapter 11, I'm going to read a rather lengthy passage when we come back next time. But God has always dealt with his people by getting them together by families. Oh, God. Who was saved when it came to, and this is before the flood, who entered the ark A family? They entered the ark. And when God led his people and he was leading, he led them as a congregation. That's what he called them. They were an assembly. He called them, listen to this, he called them a church. And they had tribes. And they had families. And they had households and fathers. See, beloved, you, you Christ, but there are no extra Christians. You belong in a flock. There is a flock for you. Now, it may not be what you may, you know, you've been looking, a place, and you get, you know, and the people. But God is dealing with individuals, and he's dealing with flocks, or he's dealing with congregations. That's how he's led his people all the way back in the Old Testament. And this goes over into the church. You can't get around all of the places where it says, and they, when you come together, when you come together in the same place, when you come together in the same place. And all the letters Paul have written to the churches. My God, what are you saying? You're done with the local New Testament church? Well, then you're done with the church, and you're done with Christ. You cannot, you can't convince Christ, because let me tell you, I wouldn't be before you if I didn't believe that this is an issue. That's why the business is happening in the local New Testament church. That's why people are being saved and they're being delivered. Now I know what the negatives are. I seldom hear anyone say anything good about the local New Testament church. Well, I'm a champion for Christ and I'm a champion. Been knocked down a lot of times. They're going to be knocked down before it's all over again. But I'm a champion for the church. And have those who loathe the assembly and have every reason. And they poison those who have just come to Christ. And then they got alienated. You can't find what you're not looking for. You can't. But we're going to close right here and read Romans chapter 11. And we're going to have some verses, I believe, to go back into the Old Testament to look at the Lord bringing his people together. I'm just going to give you one. Three times a year the males had to appear before the Lord. And they could not come empty. God brings his people together. And he says, I want you to come to the place where I have ordained for you. I know Christ is who we worship in. Don't, don't think that I don't understand that. When he talked to the woman there at the well. But the same one who did that, he's the one who gave men to teach and to lead. And to guide the church. Why would Christ write letters to the church? Beloved, if you think that you are the church, has he written you a letter? That came directly from, you know, this one book, 66 books, 31,102 verses, 783,737 words. Has he written a letter to you specifically that you are the church alone? Beloved, who has bewitched you? And we're going to pray for you. Please come back next time. Let us pray. Our Father and strong God, we thank you. Thank you, Holy Father, for giving me the wherewithal, the divine energy to stand and to proclaim this. I know there are going to be some. 
I, I understand. I understand, Holy Father. I, I, I knew. I know, and, and what I know is what I knew. This is difficult for some people. I have family. They don't go to church, but they know more about God than I do. And I don't know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Father, you know how much I know, and I know how much I know. When I open my mouth, I don't know much. But Father, I want to see those who are born again saints who have been caught up in the web of these lies that have been spun around the fact that you don't need to be in the assembly. When God is working through the assembly to save souls and through individuals as well. So, Father, I pray that conviction, that that party, that they won't rest tonight, that these words will be ringing in their spirit until they do what's right. Lord, I'm praying that they'll find their place as it was with Achan. Father, you demonstrated that he was a part of the camp and with his rebellion and his disobeying the known will of God. It didn't take long for Joshua to find him by your spirit. You went through the whole nation from the entire nation down all the way down to his father, all the way down to Achan. And Father, the same is true when it comes to your church. For your name is the name that is on the church in heaven and here on earth. Save those, Father, who are lost, who have church membership. And that's all they have on their way to hell. On roller skates, on skis, sliding right into hell. Went to church, never, ever was introduced to Jesus Christ. And, Father, I pray that you bring conviction across that young man's heart, up, upon that lady's heart, Lord. To let them know that they are undone in your presence. And if death should come sooner than later, that apart from Christ, they will go to hell. Lord, I pray that you would do what you did for many of us. You'll save us. You'll save our old ashy soul. The same way you, you saved us, you'll save theirs, Lord. And put walking in their feet and in your word in their heart and a testimony in their mouth, Lord, to go out and to do great things for you by your spirit. Glorifying you through Jesus Christ. We thank you and we give you praise. In Christ Jesus' name. Amen.